This week on Reality Check, we're interviewing Robert O'Sullivan, who holds a degree in theology and is a lifelong student about William Blake. He's here to tell us about Blake and why he's so relevant to today's issues. And I wanted to welcome you, Bob. It's great to see you. I'm so glad we're getting together to do this. I'm very curious about what you have to say about Blake. Um, why don't we start off by just saying um, a little bit about what he did. I mean, he produced poetry and things of that nature. Go ahead, if you will, and tell us a little bit about his life's work. Sure. First of all, uh, to give you the time frame, uh, William Blake was born in 1757 and died in 1827, lived 69 years, almost 70. And uh, when he died, he died in almost total obscurity and near poverty. Uh, and it uh, didn't seem likely that anyone would particularly pay attention to a very, very unusual man who had extraordinary talents, but not a good sense of how to market them. Uh, so often the case. In in his case, it was uh, uh, he made a living basically as a uh, engraver. This was the days before photography, so if someone wanted to illustrate a book, they would go to an engraver to have it engraved, and uh, he actually developed his own methods of doing that, and uh, that was sort of his day job. Mm -hmm. But uh, that day job, as he divided his time, was done basically in mornings. And in the afternoon and evening, his night job was relating between his concept of eternity and things going on in a very turbulent time in English history. Mm -hmm. Now, let's think back. This was uh, when he was a young man. It was a time of the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, and right. lots of things going on. Mm -hmm. And he was a person who deeply cared about life here and now on this earth, and uh, yet he saw so many things going really wrong and unfortunate for his country, which he thought of as Albion, which was an ancient name for England. And he did not feel at all comfortable with the way how children were being terribly mistreated. Child labor was such that uh, children as young as seven were used as chimney sweeps. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was uh, terrible in terms of one's health. Uh, imagine what one was breathing in. And right. also uh, they often had to get in very strange uh, positions within the chimneys and often were virtually deformed for life. It was also a time of, uh, and if this sounds modern, of uh, human trafficking of young girls. Oh. Uh, there was not a lot of birth control in those days. There were a lot of people who wound up in orphanages, and uh, often when they were quite young, their parents or whoever controlled them knew that one way of of uh, making money was to traffic them. And uh, if that sounds familiar with what's going on today, so did quite a few other things in Blake's life. There was so, there's, um, um, in that time, there wasn't really much of a social safety net for folks either. I no, mean, not at all. Orphanages would have been struggling, and a lot of people would have been struggling just to survive. Yeah. England was very, very much a class society. Uh, it still is to quite a degree, but in those days there was the rich, there was the monarchy, there were the lords of developing uh, industries, and then there was the overwhelming probably 95% of the people that were struggling just to survive. Blake never had any formal education as in, in school as we know it, but his parents, who were kind of middle-class uh, merchants, they sold uh, gloves and socks and haberdashery, you might call it, in those days, and, uh, but they saw Blake's talent for art. And quite at a young age, he was uh, sent off to uh, engraver school and later to an art school. And uh, as a young man, he 
learned to learn the arts of engraving, but also had his inspiration to be a artist most of his life. Uh, and that became a very important part of who he was and his contributions to society. He, his art uh, was inspired largely by Michelangelo and Albrecht Dürer, who were his favorite artists. And uh, it's kind of too bad that while Italy had both the patronage of the Roman Catholic Church and of governments there that really fostered and sponsored art in huge ways, that in England there was not that kind of tradition. In fact, in his day, the artists who made the most money were doing things like painting portraits of rich people. And, and that was a big deal because they were the photography, so they yeah. would... Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, but uh, many of the the prominent artists from those days, Gainsborough and other, and also nature scenes and mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. But right. uh, uh, what Blake really would have loved to have done was paint large things uh, in fresco style, much as was done in Italy by Michelangelo and Raphael and and, and others. But uh, England just did not have a church or a government that really was interested in that kind of massive architecturally based art. And it was just uh, the culture of that society as opposed to the culture that existed in Italy and Spain and France to uh, in similar degrees and even Germany. It, he, he would have probably had a very different career if that had been possible. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was not simply a visual artist. He was a poet. He was a uh, writer of books that might be described best as prophetic books, which were both making commentary on the life of that day, but also digging back into Christian tradition, especially the Old Testament, to bring words of uh, inspiration and judgment on things going on in the real life of society then. And he was opposed to war. He was anti-monarchist. He was opposed to slavery. He was opposed to the mistreatment of children. And one who had enormous talents, not only as an artist, but as a poet, and as this prophetic figure who created uh, a, a rather remarkable and almost total form of art. Now, many people, if they're familiar at all with Blake, are probably familiar with some of his poetry. Uh, Mm -hmm. The Songs of Innocence and Experience include poems like Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright, that uh, uh, is probably familiar to many people. Uh, I'll read it quickly. Uh, That'd be lovely. Please. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeper skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulders and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was the brain, what the anvil, what dread grasp dare its deadly terrors class. When the stars threw down their spheres and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? Uh, this was one of the Songs of Innocence and Experience. Uh, there, the Songs of Innocence especially were written for children and include beautiful uh, poems about children playing and old people watching them and nature and all of that. But he was also dealing with uh, bigger questions about life and the fact that there's Uh, evil and cruelty and all of that. And in some ways, the tiger was a symbol of uh, why this world has all of those things, as well as the world of the lamb, which was another poem that he uh, kind of uh, 
related and 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 uh, twinned with this. And that poem is "Little Lamb Who Made Thee." Dost thou know who made thee? Gave thee life and bid thee feed by the stream and o'er the mead. Gave thee clothing of delight, softest clothing, woolly bright. Gave thee such a tender voice, making all the vales rejoice. Little lamb who made thee, dost thou know who made thee? Little lamb, I'll tell thee. Little lamb, I'll tell thee. He is called by thy name, for he has called himself a lamb. He is meek and he is mild. He became a little child. I a child and thou a lamb. We are called by his name. Little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. So for Blake, both the lamb and the tiger were creatures of God. And uh, that contrariness of the two creatures uh, dominated much of his thinking. He, he once said, without contraries, there is no progression. And in these poems, he, he dealt with the, those very issues, even though he was writing poems for children. And when I said he had a total sort of art, he didn't only write these poems. He engraved them, mm-hmm. had them printed, and then the printed copies were then uh, watercolored. There were not many made. Some of them were made in little books that only had like 20 copies that ever existed. Uh, and uh, it was not lucrative for him. Another aspect of his art was he was musical. He mm-hmm. had music for all of these. And tragically, uh, he didn't know musical notation and nobody ever wrote down right. what his music was. So that's just lost. But you will find, interestingly, that uh, uh, many composers have been inspired by these poems, and uh, people like Rafe Van Williams and uh, others have, have uh, set them to their own music, and uh, you can find many ways in which Blake's music from these poems was inspired. So in terms of context, I'm, I'm wondering... Um, a lot of the poems do seem to deal a lot with God and spirituality and things of that nature. Mm-hmm. But it was a, a world that was really about that at that time. I mean, it, we didn't have the secular kind of lifestyle uh, that we have today. Is that correct? Or uh, I, I'm just that, trying to figure that out. That's pretty much correct, although the Enlightenment had been happening, mm-hmm. and so the the spirituality that was so much part of Western Christianity for so long was being surpassed by uh, a concept of reason, and and uh, everything had to be thought of and explained, and it it was a kind of denial of a of the traditional Christian or Judeo-Christian God and to be replaced by kind of a deistic God if there was thought to be any God at all. Uh, the, uh, and this was something the founding fathers of the United States were, were tied into deism much as, at least as much as to Christianity. So deism defined is? Uh, an understanding of God which was kind of like, well, he or she created everything but then let it go and it was kind of up to man and natural forces to to work things once out. the ball started rolling then yeah. it was up to us right so so in terms of his life i mean he came from a not too distinguished background i imagine that these enlightenment forces would have been you know i, I have images of um aristocrats playing at science and doing things like that, but not necessarily the common man. Would they have still been very uh, church-oriented, do you think? I mean, these are um, obscure questions, I suppose. But. Well, well, it's hard to say statistically or, or, or anything like that, but it was also a time of religious um, differences and turmoil. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the Church of England was the break off from the Roman Catholic Church, of course, right. and, and still uh, took over their lands deal. and their monasteries and, and and so forth. But then, especially, it was really the establishment church. Mm-hmm. It, it was uh, of, of the rich that ran it all and not uh, terribly, terribly interested in the plight of, of the common person. Uh, but also, at the same time, 
as a result of the Reformation, which started on the continent, there were all sorts of uh, what might be called sects, like the Quakers and the Shakers, and I'm trying to think there were one or two others that even rhymed, rhymed with that. Transcendentalists and people like uh, that. Yes, uh, and um, there were uh, even some really obscure groups, like there was one called the uh, Muggletonians, Ah, uh, Followers of a Ludwig Muggleton, who uh, was kind of a prophetic sort of figure who went around preaching in the public square and what have you. But also they, their way of worship was to rent the upper rooms in pubs mm -hmm. and uh, often uh, get uh, services where they drank a lot of ale or uh, drinks of that sort and uh, sang their own hymns that were set to beer drinking songs. And uh, of course, that's a tradition that goes back to Martin Luther, but the, yeah, yeah. that's a, a little different there too. Um, but anyway, uh, there these, these groups that, uh, well, theologians would say they came from the left wing of the Reformation, Yes, uh, were ones who were more socially conscious and more uh, with more roots in, in the lower classes than the Church of England. And, and there was still a Roman Catholic presence in England as, as there is right. indeed today. And, and so the, um, the, you were mentioning the books that he wrote were quite prophetic. So would he fit right into that, that group in some ways? Uh, in many ways, yes. Uh, and oh, another group I, I failed to mention, but it turned out to be quite important, uh, was called the Swedenborgians. Okay. <laughs> the Swedenborg was Swedish, as his name might suggest, uh, and um, both kind of a figure involved in science and chemistry, but also that kind of area that's sometimes called alchemy of uh, mm -hmm. kind of the occult as well as the scientific. And uh, he developed a lot of interesting religious ideas. And uh, although Blake was actually baptized in the Church of England, he had no real contact with it or involvement with it and detested it. Mm. Uh, he did for like a year uh, join the Swedenborgian Church. But he then had his misgivings about it. And in fact, one of his most famous books, which is called The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, started out as a spoof kind of of some of Swedenborg's own writing. So he was involved in a, a, a religious context where lots of stuff was going on. Mm -hmm. But he kind of thought he had to develop his own system rather than to become just a cog in somebody else's. Uh, I just need to take a little break here and tell the listeners that you're listening to KCIWLP, Curry Coast Community Radio 100.7 FM in beautiful Brookings, Oregon. And we're interviewing Robert O'Sullivan on the subject of Blake. So you were saying that Blake was a little bit of an oddball in some ways. <laughs> you, would you like to tell us uh, something about that part? Uh, well, um Nowadays, uh, there are some who probably would have said that he was mentally ill, that he was uh, perhaps schizophrenic, uh, and uh, that uh, things that people would be locked up for occasionally, uh, like seeing visions and hearing voices and, and things like that, were, were things that were a very important part of his life. And he talked about it frequently in, in his poetry and in his uh, discourse with other people. Uh, I should mention that uh, especially in his, in his younger years, he was involved in a coterie of people that included quite a few radicals. Uh, the group included Thomas Paine, mm -hmm. of course, who uh, was influential have been supporting the American Revolution. Another one was Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, who uh, was the first woman in English history anyway to basically make her living as a writer 
And uh, as a journalist, uh, she went to France to try and cover the French Revolution. Uh, she had some issues there and wound up coming back pregnant. And uh, uh, But anyway, uh, she was a friend of Blake's. Uh, others included Godwin, who was a uh, famous philosopher in those days, uh, James Johnson, who was a publisher who published the works of a lot of the radical sorts uh, in England, uh, as well as Joseph Priestley, the chemist. Uh, these were all, uh, and some artistic figures, uh, Henri uh, Fuseli, who was, became a good friend of Blake's and whose art is somewhat similar to Blake's, was another figure of that sort, and uh, as well as some uh, literary figures. He, he was involved in an interesting life, but they all found him rather strange and unusual and didn't quite know especially what to make of his uh, ideas that, or his contention that he was seeing visions and hearing voices and uh, writing some of his stuff from dictation from whatever divine channeling channel or, or, or whatever. Uh, and um, But part of his way of dealing with that was he saw that a lot of England as a result of the uh, Enlightenment was becoming enamored with the thoughts of Newton and what he called Newton's sleep. And one of his most famous quotations is, now I a fourfold vision see, and a fourfold vision is given to me. Tis fourfold in my supreme delight, and threefold in soft Beulah's night, and twofold always. May God keep God us keep from single vision and Newton's sleep. <laughs> and one of his most famous uh, works of art uh, is rather unusual in that it has a figure of this naked, muscular figure whom he called Newton kind of crouched over. It's not sh clear whether it's underwater or in a place where there are just uh, lichens and, and uh, all sorts of interesting things growing. And Newton is ignoring all that, and all he could pay attention to was what he could vis uh, what he could measure with a compass and a protractor or uh -huh. whatever. It's, it's a, a very famous image that's been redone in unusual ways even in the 20th century. Right. So he's he's one of those folks who's calling us back to the direct experience of whatever is out there. Yes, and. He he's uh, talking about these fourfold visions. He the the single vision in Newton's sleep was just seeing what you could measure and what you could explain scientifically uh, and, right. and calculate. And uh, uh, but his idea of a twofold vision was uh, when you're walking along and you see a thistle, you might also at the same time see a hoary old man. And uh, the the other extremes of uh, what he called Beulah's night. Uh, was a, a, an image, image of kind of a heavenly, eternal way of looking at whatever you're encountering. And beyond that, the, the fourth fold one was a vision that probably he and he alone uh, uh, experienced. Um, I should mention that he was married to uh, Catherine, and um, uh, she was um, born illiterate, or not born illiterate, I guess we all are, <laughs> but she was uh, illiterate when she met Blake, and uh, Blake had had a bad romantic experience with another woman who rejected him, and uh, she kind of uh, caught him on the rebound, as it were, and they became extraordinarily good life partners. Hmm. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, I mean, she, she did, uh, I guess, what Mike be called housekeeper roles of cooking and making mm -hmm. clothing and mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. But she was also his assistant in uh, in his printing and in his watercoloring. And uh, uh, she enabled the art to happen. And she, although she didn't totally understand him at all and what he was writing, she was uh, someone who was deeply sympathetic with, with his visions and ways of looking at things. So 
I imagine that he probably had a lot of struggle given that he was pretty out of step with a lot of folks around him. Uh, well, yes. Um, and um, uh, part of being out of step in, in the relatively early days of his life had to do with politics. And mm-hmm. uh, he, he was one of few people in, in London who had the courage to wear a red hat during the French Revolution to celebrate the idea that maybe that sort of revolution could happen in monarchist England. Uh, and um, uh, there were other ways in, in which people just didn't know what to make of his thoughts and uh, his art. And much of his art is rather fantastic. It looks like uh, uh, some modern-day uh, illustrated books that are of the uh, fantastic art variety. Psychedelic things. Psychedelic yeah. stuff. Uh, there have been American movies that were partially inspired by uh, his art, including uh, uh, the Hannibal Lecter stuff and the Red Dragon. That was an image from from Blake. Uh, he's inspired uh, uh, strange stuff going on in music of all sorts. Uh, uh, there's a fair amount of rock musicians who, in one way or another, related to Blake. Uh, the Doors were named because of his famous quotation, if the doors of perception were cleansed, right. we would see things as they are, which is infinite. And uh, just uh, uh, extraordinary influence there. And in poetry, uh, no one really paid any attention to his poetry while he was alive. His art got slight attention, Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was only maybe 50 years later that people started noticing how powerful it was and how important it was. And uh, now uh, what is sort of the informal um, national anthem of England uh, is um, one that's been set to music uh, by a prominent composer in England after World War or during World War I, and uh, it uh, became kind of the official song of the British Labor Party, and it's sort of like a national anthem there when they have a what are called the Proms Concert in Covent Garden, the big uh, uh, musical center of classic and pop sort of music in London. They, they always end up their thing with singing those words, and when the... Uh, Olympics were held in London, the initial pageant was all based on on these words, and I will read them now because they're yes, so important. Uh, the first line is, and did those feed in ancient time? And this is a uh, reference actually uh, to the fact that in Christian understanding of its history in England, um, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, a figure from the New Testament, allegedly came to England in in the first century and and uh, kind of let Jesus's feet uh, be there. And mm-hmm. anyway, it goes and did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green, and was the holy Lamb of God on England's pleasant pasture seen, and did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills, and was Jerusalem builded here? among these dark satanic mills. Mm -hmm. Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear. O clouds unfold, bring me my chariots of fire. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. And then he quotes the Hebrew scriptures, would to God that all the Lord's people were prophets. Mm. It's lovely. The the only problem with this is people from across the political sphere in England all tend to identify with it. Yes. And it was hardly <laughs> what Blake intended. And yeah. in fact, before it in 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 the prophetic book, it uh, where it appeared not as a hymn or not even as a poem, uh, there's stuff that makes it clear that he was really upset about the satanic hills, uh, uh, mills about the. Um, way in which so many of the young, especially children and widows and and women, were exploited, and he he wasn't 
trying to make a Jerusalem that was was for the rich and powerful, but one with equality and some of those things that one can find uh, honored in the Old Testament prophets. It's amazing mm-hmm. how these things get co-opted by the other side so often. Indeed. <laughs> Before we get too far away, I wanted to just comment that his emphasis on direct experience, however bizarre it might have been in his world, um, you know, that was so far, like Freud was one of the first people who really talked about valuing the inner experience, right? Mm-hmm. Sort of the father of psychology. And that was, what, 50 years after its time, something uh, like that, no, give or more take. More like 75. Or, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, and, and you know, Jung, he was, of course, was deeply influenced and by And that was even well. later, though. Yeah. 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 But um, definitely uh, so far ahead of probably everybody else around him in that sense of, of honoring that inner experience. Mm-hmm. And part of Blake's message, at least communicated in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, has to do with uh, uh, sexual freedom. Mm-hmm. And although he never, to anyone's knowledge, uh, dishonored his marriage, he, he was one who really thought that people should follow their desires and not be uh, suppressed by the type of ways in which churches were saying no and thou shalt not and so forth. Right. And uh, when the 60s and the hippie revolution and all that was going on in this country, a lot of people found Blake as one of the people who... He was really popular, uh, I remember. Who, and uh, uh, who kind of helped people understand that the op- suppression and such that had happened in earlier days and fostered by religion was not appropriate. Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about um, how you came to be so entranced by his work, maybe personally, as well as how you see it relating to issues of today. Mm-hmm. Um, personally, in college, uh, I think I took a course, as many would in those days, in English romantic poetry. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, Coleridge and Worth, Wordsworth and Shelley and, and, and so forth. And somehow those important, historically as they were, were nowhere, nowhere near as intriguing to me right. as Blake. And partially because of while they were writing poems about nature and 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 its beauties and that kind of stuff, uh, he was writing poems that also had to do with real live social issues, real live oppression, and a real live understanding of what for him was his understanding of the Judeo-Christian heritage, and which he didn't see as one that focused on sin and guilt and that the way especially many Christians would, but on issues of justice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the Old Testament or Hebrew prophets that uh, he was inspired by the most had to, do, had to be Isaiah and Ezekiel and uh, Amos. And, and Ezekiel was especially important to him because of, of some of the visual imagery. He has wonderful paintings of Ezekiel seeing the wheel. And uh, he was therefore uh, one who, who understood uh, faith as uh, eternity breaking through into the present reality to work for justice and peace. And uh, another one of his most famous poems in the Songs of Experience, I should explain that the Songs of Innocence were published a few years before the Songs of Experience. And the Songs of Innocence, uh, celebrated as the term suggests, innocence and lambs and children and play and having fun and that sort of thing. And although there were elements of, uh, you know, there's some things wrong in our society, Mm -hmm. when he was kind of disillusioned more in the following uh, three years or so and uh, wrote the Songs of Experience, which have a decidedly more dark and negative kind of tone. I mean, 
talking about the tiger and, and so forth. Uh, and uh, one of his most famous is called London, which I will read right now. I wandered through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind-forged manacles I hear. Mm. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most are the harlot midnight streets I hear, how the youthful harlots curse, blasts the newborn infant's tear, and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. Now this poem takes some explanation. Uh, a modern writer about Blake's relevance today said it might be good to change it instead of saying, when I wandered through each chartered street, to be, say, corporate street mm. where, and uh, where the corporate Thames does flow. And I was recently in England to, to see a major Blake exhibit at the Tate Britain Museum, and one could certainly see how corporate uh, that, that place Because charter is. is like the, the monarchy would give different people charters to yeah. go exploit the New World, for instance, yeah. and things like that. Yeah, yeah. the yeah. East India Company and, mm -hmm. and, and all of those. And anyway, he... He had this vision of Albion, of England, as a fair and just and equal type society, but he was seeing what was going on in England where there's all those people who are unhappy and there are the cries of the children who were being used as chimney sweeps. And as is often true, uh, soldiers were hapless. They were... Cannon very, fodder. They, they were the, what'd you say? Cannon fodder. Yeah, cannon fodder. They, they were uh, there to do whatever strange people in charge thought they should do, and they were just caught in, in that. And, and he was recognizing that in, in a day in which uh, uh, it became seditious even to speak ill of the monarchy there. And in fact, Blake himself was at one point arrested and charged for sedition. What had happened, Blake lived virtually all of his life in London. He, um, for three years, lived in Sussex, south of London, because a, a, a fairly well-to-do poetic friend of his offered to let him, or arranged for him to stay there. And while there, Blake once found a drunken soldier kind of lingering on his property, and they had somewhat of a confrontation, and un, among other things, Blake, who apparently had a temper, said something like, damn the king. And because of that, he was arrested and tried for sedition. Wow. And the penalty could have been hanging. Uh, and uh, he was fortunately acquitted, but uh, that obviously was not a type of... Uh, uh, experience anyone would want to go through. Uh, he um, still kind of kept going and kept the faith, but it was his own faith and his own vision that was so different from what was going on with most of the people in London at the time. Well, when we started, uh, before we started recording, actually, you were mentioning how much you enjoyed um, relating Blake with students. Oh, yes. And what it means to them. Can you say a little bit more about that experience? Sure. I taught high school in Oakland for 23 years or so. And um, uh, I, I guess my way of learning to teach was kind of to try things out and see if they worked. Right. And uh, in uh, traditional literature courses, there was this canon of stuff that you were supposed to let people read and hope that they would enjoy. Uh, and um, uh, But a lot of it uh, I found to be boring myself and a lot of it to be boring to the students who were supposed to be reading it. And... Uh, so I tried to 
do what I later started to calling my breakthroughs. <laughs> and and I, I would uh, have them exposed to some of this poetry and uh, especially the marriage of heaven and hell as well and ask them to try and write things that were in the same spirit or, or the same style and, rec- and also the fact that they're poems. And, and Blake often uh, wrote with fairly simple uh, rhythms uh, often it's iambic pentameter, or not necessarily pentameter, but or or, or else troic. And, and uh, uh, anyway, I, I could teach some of the techniques of poetry as well as help them uh, come up with imagery and, and and so forth. That that was often startlingly good. I, I now wish I was a little better at saving some of their examples, but uh, oh, I uh, thought it was amazing. Yeah. You're listening to KCIW LP, Curry Coast Community Radio, 100.7 FM in beautiful Brookings, Oregon. We're talking with Robert O'Sullivan about William Blake. And I think working with kids with this material must have been um, quite wonderful from the point of view of having a way to get them excited about some of these more ineffable concepts that are just sort of hard to put across, but you can Mm -hmm. in his poetry. Mm -hmm. And um, interestingly, uh, I was teaching as rap was developing, and uh, I wound up uh, finding ways to let them see comparisons with how rap is structured with with this, and uh, to also recognize that that is a way of communicating, which is somewhat like what Blake was trying to do, even though much of rap I, I don't really like at all because of its misogyny and, right. and obscenity and this and that. It, it nonetheless has uh, some similarities to this kind of way of helping poetry to let people deal with the issues of the day. So in terms of relevance for today, I suppose there's some some obvious um, parallels. And you, you want to talk to that a little bit? Because I know you've been politically active in your day and still are to some degree. Um, well, yes. I mean, just for one thing, reminding people that the issues of today have been around for a long, long time. In the right. London poem, uh, I, I was uh, sharing it with someone the other day, and she wondered about what's this stuff about Blast the newborn's infant tears and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. Uh, uh, you don't really associate marriage with hearse unless you think it's a, a terrible, a deathly thing. But what he's referring to here is the fact that there, well, childhood prostitution or, or teenage prostitution is sort of an oxymoron. It's as that has come up in recent headlines about Jeffrey Epstein and all that. Um, but in earlier, uh, the, the verses just before them uh, talk about the youthful harlot's curse. A lot of young girls were getting what then were called or venereal diseases or sexually transmitted diseases, and and uh, then they would go home to their wives, and all of a sudden their wives would get them, and that was what that reference was to. And Indeed, mm-hmm. that same sort of stuff still goes on. And, and uh, ironically, uh, one part of my life was I worked in the California legislature when Ronald Reagan was governor, and my boss, who was a Chinese-American woman, got into a huge dispute with him about whether one should teach about what then were called venereal diseases in mm-hmm. public schools mm-hmm. uh, to help stem a... a um, epidemic that was sometimes happening in those days. This was in, in the early 70s and is also reappearing in other ways today. Uh, the other issues about industrialization clearly are, are still around about societies. Some people are making all sorts of money on the labors of a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And uh, the inequality of income is becoming more extreme and in many ways back the way it was in England in those days. Who was it, Franklin, that said, you know, you have your democracy, and I'm just paraphrasing really badly here. Now let's see if you can keep it. Yes. So as we go through these cycles of all these same issues over and over again. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was slavery. 
there was prejudice uh, based on religion. And uh, Blake, uh, uh, Blake was definitely a Christian, but in a very unorthodox sort of way. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he drew on, on the symbols and, and words of the Bible and illustrated them in many, many different ways. Uh, but he was one who also uh, uh, recognized that uh, uh, in a poem that he, he wrote about what is called divine image, he identified the heart of the Judeo-Christian message as having to do with mercy, pity, peace, and love. The poem called The Divine Image goes as follows. To mercy, pity, peace, and love, all pray in their distress, and to these virtues of delight return their thankfulness. For mercy, pity, peace, and love is God our Father dear, and mercy, pity, peace, and love is man his child in care. For mercy has a human heart, pity a human face, and love the human form divine, and peace the human dress. Then every man of every clime that prays in his distress, prays to the human form divine, love, mercy, pity, peace. And all who love the human form, in heathen Turk or Jew, where mercy, love, and pity dwell, their God is dwelling too. So he was, he was Christian, but he was one who recognized that the divine image appears in all religions in various different forms. And his understanding of Christianity uh, was to a large degree an understanding that Jesus was a person of extraordinary imagination. He Mm -hmm. was a storyteller Mm -hmm. and someone who had his proverbs and his uh, epigram, um, epigrams and sayings and things like that that help people understand coping with the here and now. And uh, for Blake, uh, he was not totally dis- upset that he wasn't making a huge impact on his society because he thought he lived as part of eternity, that he, he had conversations with the prophets of the Hebrews, and he had conversations with uh, uh, other people in his imagination and in his creative expression, and to uh, live a life of imagination that proclaims justice and peace and, and mercy like this poem does was to understand that the divine breaks through here and now and not in a afterlife that people are trying to get through for other reasons. Yeah, wonderful stuff in that way. And and such a a lot of permission to find one's own path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, And part of his um, seeing his own path was expressed very well in words that are pretty famous. To see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. And then the rest of that is talking about how when we're cruel to animals and nature, when we uh, misuse the creation, that we're defiling this wonderful creation. Uh, Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, this is actually a longer thing, but um, let me read some of it. Okay, that'd be great. Um, a robin redbreast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. A dovehouse filled with doves and pigeons shudders hell through all its regions. A dog starved at his master's gate predicts the ruin of the state. A horse misused upon the road calls to heaven for human blood. Each outcry of the hunted hare, a fiber from the brain does tear. A skylark wounded in the wing, a cherubim does cease to sing. The gamecock, clipped and armed for fight, does the rising sun affright. Every wolf's and lion's howl raises from hell a human soul. The wild deer wandering here and there keeps the human soul from care. The lamb misused breeds public strife and yet forbids the butcher's knife. 
and then it goes on and on like that. Wow. There are so many modern issues. That, yeah, you've that, got the vegetarian rationales in there, all oh, kinds of things. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and and a, a respect for creation mm -hmm. and an honoring of what an extraordinary world we all find ourselves in. Yes, yes. So it, uh, on one hand, it seems like there's an ecstatic element Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, there's this sort of anger there too, you know. Oh yeah, there. Um, and um, I was going to mention a little about um, his impact on other poets. Uh, T. S. Eliot. Uh, I'm not don't remember the exact stage, but commended him for his brutal honesty, mm -hmm. and uh, said it was extraordinary. And uh, Many other poets uh, were deeply influenced by Blake, uh, especially William Butler Yeats, who was important in, in uh, publishing uh, Blake uh, in, in during his lifetime with a little commentary to it. Uh, and uh, uh, he was one who himself considered to be in touch with Blake. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're called Blake adepts that he had somehow <laughs> experienced uh, uh, Blake in ways I don't quite remember as to how they were. And another more, very important but very different poetic figure is Allen Ginsberg, mm -hmm. who uh, looks at his own development as a poet as having been deeply influenced by a time in which he had an ecstatic sort of uh, experience reading The Sunflower, which is one of the, the songs of innocence mm -hmm. and experience. And... Uh, uh, a lot of other poets and other writers and all sorts of different genres have had an amazing uh, influence of Blake in, in their writings. Oh. Yeah. And Bob, you had another poem you wanted to share with us. Uh, yes, this is from the Songs of Innocence and gives some of the really playful, childish uh, glee that he experienced when he was talking about young children. It's called The Laughing Song. When the green woods laugh with the voice of joy and the dimpling stream runs laughing by. When the air does laugh with our merry wit and the green hills laugh with the noise of it. When the meadows laugh with lively green and the grasshopper laughs in the merry scene. When Mary and Susan and Emily with their sweet round mouth sing, ha ha, he. When the painted birds laugh in the shade. When our table with cherries and nuts is spread. Come live and be merry and join with me to sing the sweet chorus of ha ha e. Thank you for that. Um, so we're getting down towards the end of our time here. Are there any other poems you'd like to share with us to sort of read us out? Uh, this we is perhaps the perfect way to end, uh, <laughs> and that is a, a short little, oh, it's not quite the ending, but uh, anyway, this is a short little thing that was published in one of, or written in one of his notebooks. It was never published. But it goes, he who binds to himself a joy does the winged life destroy. But who he who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. And Blake is seen Beautiful. as someone who, who more than almost anyone lived in his idea of eternity's sunrise. Uh, That's lovely. And another famous phrase of his that I... I, I read a bit earlier, but I, I didn't mention, but, and that's the phrase, mind-forged manacles. Uh, mm -hmm. The image is that humans put manacles on themselves that come from the mind, and they need to be removed, they need to be gotten rid of, and rather uh, we should be open to the way in which the divine breaks through in experience, in a vision of nature, and especially uh, in the community of people. He once wrote that uh, birds have nests and, and foxes have holes, humans friendship. And he saw, oh, it's nice. saw that friendship and connection between human pe humans with each other mm -hmm. was an important part of having that imagination that makes the world more beautiful and more just. It seems like his work is so timely, especially in America and very westernized countries that share our culture to some degree where 
we don't value not only friendship, but the natural world and being in the moment and all these things that we get so caught up, we lose track of that make us very human. Mm -hmm. um, I want to make a plug for something uh, that one can easily access on YouTube. Uh, if you go to YouTube and put in William Blake and uh, then the word omnibus, mm -hmm. uh, there's a like 58 uh, minute documentary on Blake that is extremely well done. Oh. There are other things you can find on YouTube about Blake as well, but that's, that's the place to start. And I thought I'd mention, since I'm now living in, in Brookings, I uh, made mention to my recent trip to London to see the Blake exhibit. And one of the people there said, oh, you should have a Blake fest. And, Definitely. <laughs> and uh, so I organized one uh, that's going to happen before this is on the air, but uh, I'm probably going to organize a few after this is on the air. And if any of you are interested in that, just email me. My email is rhosul at earthlink.net. That's rhosul at earthlink.net. And I'd be happy to inform you of a future event of that sort. Well, that sounds fantastic. I'm really glad to hear about that. So in conclusion, any last thoughts you'd like to share? Well, isn't it amazing that someone who died in 1827 and was buried in a pauper's field uh, and was barely known by any contemporaries, uh, oh, at one time, Blake decided to put on his own exhibition, mm -hmm. and uh, this was in the upper room of a shop that his brother uh, had, and it was a total flop. Uh, he didn't sell anything, and right. the one time that in his whole lifetime that any reviewer from any newspaper reviewed his art said that he was a unfortunate lunatic whose personal style kept him from being locked up. <laughs> right. And uh, he was one who uh, could have been extremely important if he were in another country at his time, but he wasn't. But his impact since then has been extraordinary. Well, I'm so glad you were here to share this with us. Uh, it's been really a fun time to, to hear your readings and uh, find out a little bit more about what an extremely interesting character he is, especially in that historical context is so far removed from today. And uh, I think we should have definitely a Blake Fest. I hope people will take advantage of getting a hold of you. Would you like to repeat your email one more time just okay, for the it's, record? It's rhosul at earthlink.net. And uh, I give my phone number to 510, my old Oak Town area code, 510-872-1124. Okay, that's great. And um, in conclusion, this has been Reality Check. We've been interviewing Robert O'Sullivan on the subject of William Blake. Thank you so much for coming and sharing all this with us. Really look forward to seeing Blake Fest take off. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to thank also Pi White, our co-producer and technical support. This has been Lee Tooley for Reality Check on KCIW. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>